Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to the Hoodview Church. I'm Brian Sims, the associate pastor here, and on behalf of the whole family, we want to welcome you. Hope you've had a good week, and if you haven't, I hope that it's a lot better today than it has been, and that you experience some peace and joy in being able to come together with people that uh, can hopefully uplift you to Jesus. We've got some things on, going on around here that I want you to be aware of so you can uh, take the opportunity to be involved. Uh, just after the service today, there will be a fellowship meal just down the hallway to your right, a free meal. So please stick around and join us for that. Uh, also want to let you know that this is in the bulletin if you want further information about it. Uh, but there's a memorial service this afternoon at 4 p.m. here for Dennis Bieland. And uh, he passed away um, on August 14. Uh, just down this, the road here to my right, your left, we've got an awesome school for preschool on up through 8th grade, Hoodview Adventist School. So if you've got kids or grandkids and you're looking for a place to get them in school or looking toward the future, I want to highly recommend our school, Hoodview Adventist School. It's an amazing group. And on this Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m., there's a fall festival there, so there'll be a lot of great food and games. Uh, and it's, if you haven't had the opportunity to be on campus there recently or at all, it'd be a great time to go there and see what it's all about and get acquainted with people a little bit. So that's tomorrow from 1 to 4 p.m. Also want to remind our PAA constituents, Portland Adventist Academy constituent delegates, that our constituency session is this Tuesday night at 7 p.m. in the chapel. So if you're a constituent of that fine school, please make sure that you are attending at that meeting. Of course, anyone who is interested in what's happening at Portland Adventist Academy is welcome to attend, uh, but particularly we want our constituents to make sure that we're there. Uh, Georgie Schnibby wanted me to make sure that all of you know that there's a chili and cornbread cook-off on October 27 at 5 p.m. here. Now, I'm just curious, how many of you think you have a shot at winning the chili cook-off? we got one, two, three, four, five. Alex, I like that. like the bold move from the young man. So uh, that will be taking place. There's more information about it in your bulletin, but cornbread and chili cook-off, please make sure that you plan to attend that. That's going to be a good time. Hey, I wanted to invite Dr. Tim Eric up for a minute. He's organizing a really awesome trip that the Hoodview Church is helping to sponsor. And uh, he's going to tell you all about it and how to sign up. Good morning, everyone. Um, this last um, spring, um, I talked to people at Portland Adventist Academy and said, hey, I've got an idea for a concept, something I, I don't know that's ever been done before. Um, a lot of people are interested in Christian education. Not just here, we've got some great schools around, but what about on the other side of the world? Um, we have six Adventist colleges in Europe, and uh, wouldn't it be neat if we could visit all six um, over the course of a couple of weeks? And so um, over the summer, I put together this program, um, and then uh, we ran into some interesting challenges. It was, it's gonna be this coming summer after students graduate, and uh, some of the schools in the area were uncomfortable with the idea of, of students, once they've graduated, they're no longer covered by student insurance and everything, and so it threw a little wrench into, into my plans. But the Hoodview Church stepped up and said, hey, Christian education, we will help sponsor that and, um, and allow uh, this program to move forward. And so if, if we can have the next slide there, I don't know if it's, if that's, uh, there were some slides loaded here, but um, we are planning on, there we go, nice. We're planning on um, June 28th this summer to fly into Prague and then head up to, um, to Friedensau, the Adventist uh, University in northern Germany near Berlin and near Wittenberg where Luther was. Um, then head over, go under the channel, under the English Channel, over to, to London, to England, stay at Newbold College then go down to Portsmouth and uh, take a ferry across to Normandy, invade Normandy, just like, well, not quite like they did in D-Day, but, um, and then go down to Paris for a few days, and then all the way down, long train ride down to Segunto in Spain, um, and spending a couple days at each of these places, then up to Cologne, where I spent my sophomore year of college, and climb up the French Alps there behind uh, uh, the school and look out over Lake Geneva, and then go down to, uh, 
to Florence, um, where Via Aurora, we have an, a school there, and then finally up to, um, up to Austria, for our, our Adventist school, school there, visit Salzburg along the way, and then back to, to Prague. So if that's something that might interest you, here's the, here's the deal. This was designed as a program for, uh, and we can skip to the next uh, slide here. Thank you. Um, this was designed for young people, high school, college age. So if you think you can keep up with high schoolers, if you could carry a, a little backpack, uh, walk at least three miles without stopping, then maybe this is the, this is the trip for you. And uh, trick is, it's, um, we're needing to buy tickets this next uh, couple weeks here. And so um, the time to get your name in if you're interested in doing this is this coming Monday. And then we've got a week or two before first payment would be in. So not a lot of time, but if you're interested in joining in on a, an energetic a tour of Christian education in Europe, this is the summer to do it. I don't think a tour like this has ever been done before. So you could be part of something new. Uh, next slide there gives them some specifics. And, um, and then finally, um, there are some, a few pictures of some of the places that we'll be visiting on the fourth slide, if that works out. All right. Yeah, there we go. Some, some details. And um, while we're down at Segunto, we'll visit the beach there on the Mediterranean. Um, there's a f picture of Normandy and a tank and such. And there's the ferry we'll be taking across over to, to Normandy. Anyhow, I'll be happy to have you join in. Come see me after, after church or call me or email me during the week. And um, we'll see what we can do to see a little bit of what God is doing on our sister schools um, in Europe. Thank you very much. Good morning. I want to add a warm welcome to the welcome already given. Happy Sabbath. I don't know about you, but springtime is one of my favorite times of the year. But almost more than springtime with all the new life and beauty of everything flowering is autumn. I love autumn. And the the uh, display here in front, thank you, Cecilia, for putting that together. It's just um, a beautiful time of year. And, you know, you drive down the road, roads, different places, and, oh, it just takes my breath away. Those leaves are going to be gone sooner than we'd like that are so vibrant and gorgeous. And, of course, we can make parallels to what, is, what God is doing in our life I'm just going to stick with, it's great to live where there are changing seasons. And I just uh, am, am thrilled with the beautiful colors and what God creates for us to enjoy. I want to invite you to stand as we sing our call to worship, Seekers of Your Heart. Lord, we want to know you, live our lives to show.
a busy week for each one of us, busy in different ways. Help us to focus on you. Thank you for this opportunity to worship together in freedom. We don't know anything different like so many of our brothers and sisters around the world. Your church was born with so much pain, Lord. Persecutions, hardships on every hand. Hatred and violence from every quarter. Thank you for the strength of the Holy Spirit that enabled Paul to persevere. Thank you for your gift of grace that enabled him to hold true to the testimony of Christ. Father, if I ever experience this kind of pain, help me to see with spiritual eyes the new life that is being birthed through my suffering and help me to hold out and hold on to the testimony of Christ. Our Father, the Son of God, our brother, and our Redeemer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. You know, we often come to worship services and I think in our minds just sort of automatically think we're, we're the spectators and whoever is up front, different ones, they're the performers. I'll tell you something, folks. It's not us and them. <laughs> worship is all us. Every one of us has a part in the services that take place here. Whether you realize it or not, you do. You sing praises. You, you pray to God corporately, not just one person. And we are all given a privilege as receivers of God's blessings to turn some back to him by way of saying thank you. Today's offering is for the church budget. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward and let's ask God's blessing as we give our offerings today, okay? In support of us as God's people. Lord, we thank you so much for all you do for us. You're always there. You're present with us. You care about us. You lead us. You impress our minds. Thanks so much. Lord, accept what little gifts we can give back today with a grateful heart to you. And multiply their usefulness like the loaves and fishes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Wow, it's good to see a truck overflowing with money. Okay, you ready? Go. Yeah, I wouldn't give it to him either. <laughs> there you go. It's still debatable. I want to take you kids back to a long time ago when I was young and was given my first job as a pastor. Brenda and I, my wife, we went to Phoenix, Arizona, and we pastored the Glendale Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we were also responsible for the Wickenburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, the churches were 60 miles apart. And so whenever I had to go to Wickenburg, you get on a road and you drive. And in those days, that took little, right around an hour to get from our house all the way up to Wickenburg. It was way out in the country. And as I was driving one day up on the side of a hill in the desert, because it, well, there was no big trees like we've got here. There was some pine trees, but mainly it was just little scrubby brush. I saw the craziest thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was a carved man that had been carved out of wood that stood six feet tall and had been painted bright colors like an Indian. And it had an Indian headdress and it had Indian clothes and it was just wild. And so I stopped and drove up the little road to go see who was doing this. And I met a man by the name of Ralph, Ralph Gallagher. Now I'm six feet two inches tall at least i was back then before i squashed and uh i ralph was taller than i was and he was bigger around by a long ways and i said what are you doing and he says i'm carving indians in the mountain i said why do you do that he says because crazy people buy them <laughs> and i said wow that's exciting and I talked to him, and every time I would go to Wickenburg, I would pull over and see Ralph. And one day he said, are you a circuit riding preacher? And I said, what does that mean? He says, back in the old days when the preachers would come around, there weren't many churches, and so there weren't many pastors. And so the pastor would get a horse, and he would sit on the horse, and he would ride from church to church every day, go to a different church. And so they called them circuit riding preachers because they went around in circles. Other pastors I know do that too, but this was on a horse. <laughs> now, <laughs> and then he looked at me and he said, stop here next Tuesday when you come up. And I said, okay. And so Tuesday when I got to his house, he brought me something in a blanket and I said in a blanket what do you get what do you got in the blanket and he said if you're a circuit riding preacher what do you have and I said well the first thing I have is a Bible so that's right what's the second thing you have if you're a circuit riding preacher a horse you got it what's the third thing you have a hat because any good circuit riding preacher has got to have a hat or his head's gonna get burned by the Sun and then Ralph handed me the blanket because he said the fourth thing every good secret writer preacher has is a pack rolled up on his saddle that's got his extra set of clothes, a toothbrush, some toothpaste, and it's got his bed. And so I took it from him, and I want to show you what he gave me. This is what Ralph Gallagher made for me. Now, what do you think? It's a circuit riding preacher, isn't it? He's got a hat. What else does he have? What do you know about a circuit riding preacher by looking at my man? He's got a Bible. That's right. It's really important. What else do you know about him? Look closely. Tell me something else about the circuit riding preacher. What do his legs look like? They're bowed. Why are they bowed? 
because he spends his life living on a horse. And if you're on a horse a lot, instead of your knees knocking together, your knees will never knock together because they're busy going around the horse. And so see how he's got circuit riding horse knees? What else do you know about him by looking at him? What's his mouth doing? Preaching. It's open, that's right, because he's preaching, because a circuit riding preacher talks a lot. And who does he talk about? Look at his eyes. He talks about Jesus because he's always looking up and telling you to look up and see Jesus, right? Now, today, when Pastor Brian is talking, he's going to talk about a circuit riding preacher. Did you know that? That's the subject of his sermon. Paul was a circuit riding preacher. He went from town to town. He wore a hat so he wouldn't get his side sunburned. He was always looking up at Jesus. His mouth, if you read a lot, almost all the New Testament was written by this guy. He was always talking. What was he talking about? He was talking about the Bible, about Jesus, right? Now, there's only one thing about the circuit riding Paul that we don't know. Did he ever ride a horse? I don't know. If you go through the Bible, and especially the book of Acts, it never talks about Paul riding a horse. It talks about him being with people who were riding horses, but it never says, and when Paul got off his horse, what it does say is that everywhere he went, he told people about Jesus, and he went a lot. So there you go. When you grow up, you can be a circuit riding preacher too. And you may not even need a horse. Have a good Sabbath. I invite you to sing with us, starting with a, a great, the great words of Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice, great.
you to stand as we sing. We are standing on holy ground. Stand with us. great Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be able to come into your presence and to know that we're not the only ones here, but you have promised that when we do this, you're here with us, you're here in us. Lord, we seek your face today and your word, we seek your insights that in ways that will assist us to live our lives so that we reflect you to those around us. Lord, we come here with all sorts of luggage today, with all kinds of loads we're trying to lug around. I pray that we may just sort of put the bags down as you've invited us to do and take upon us your load because you've told us that your burden is easy and your yoke is light. Father, let us trade what we try so hard to do but can't for what you've already done and want to. Touch our lives. Lead us forward. Bless us with this Sabbath blessing we seek today. In Jesus' name, amen. And what a great time of worship we've had already, haven't we? The beautiful music, the children's story, the, uh, the prayer just is moving. Thank you. This is Ray Berg. How many of you know Ray Berg? Many of you, I can see. He's getting to be a familiar face. Uh, the cross that Ray has been carrying this year is to stand up here nearly every week to give you updates on the Bible experience, our devotional project here at the Hoodview Community where we're reading through Scripture together. And uh, it's nice to have you here again. Why don't you tell us what you got with you? Well, first of all, in my hands here is a sheet of all the people that have written for this thing. 
There's 115 people I've heard now that there's one more that's been added to this list. 116 people that wrote for this this year. And I think that's amazing. That's awesome. Amen. Especially since Brian and I and Jim thought we were going to have to write a lot of these. <laughs> which I'm glad we didn't. So anyway. The last 13 time slots. So let's get these done. <laughs> I pray that you get them done. No, I know you'll get them done because we've got something coming up next year I think we're going to enjoy. We're going to continue this on uh, down a little bit different path possibly, but we want to do this again next year because we feel that it's been a real blessing to the church and so and to their, our community by the way I still have three people following that are not in the church so if you share it it will go out so last four let's fill them up thanks all right if, if for uh you know you haven't you've been uh not here recently and have just heard about this it's our devotional project and these sheets are just an opportunity for you to sign up to write a short 100 to 300 word devotional. You don't have to be a part of this community on a regular basis. In fact, we'd really enjoy it if, if you're not here regularly and you decided to uh, participate. And uh, anyway, just you can go to hoodviewbible.com to experience what these devotionals are like and uh, hope that you'll continue to participate in that. We've got a power word drawing for today. Cecilia, do you want to do this? Do you have? Any, I don't know if you have any students that are going to be in here in this. Okay, I'll take your two old kids. Okay. They're not. They're, they think they're too old, but they're not. Kevin. Kevin. Oh, oh, Kevin's not here. I don't. Is Kevin? No. Okay. Must be present to win as always. Joshua. Joshua. There you go. How many has Joshua? I don't know. I. We should keep track. He's. He's. He's, he's definitely on the leaderboard. Let me see if I can find something annoying that your dad won't like. Here's a Bible stories coloring book and a glowing ball. Good. Very good. Oh, there's a Rubik's Cube, too, if you want that. No? Okay. Good. All right, boys and girls, you can just go ahead and take those blue cards, write your name down on there, and uh, the power word, and uh, keep track of how many times that power word is used. And our power word today is Paul, the circuit-riding preacher. Didn't you love that? Man, it made me really thankful not to have to ride a horse like that. This has probably never happened to you, but I belong to some groups that have made really dumb decisions. Has that ever happened to you? I remember when I was a boy, I belonged to a family, and my parents announced to me that we were moving to Bakersfield. We're moving where? I didn't know at the time what that meant. But maybe your parents have said to you, hey, we're moving. And you said, we're moving where? That seems like a really dumb decision. Sometimes spouses have conversations that sound a little bit like this. You invested in what? How much? Those are hard conversations. You belong to a group that made a dumb decision. Some of you are probably uh, still dealing with the effects of hearing this sort of conversation. Oh, you're so-and-so's brother? Oh, have I ever told you about... Tired of hearing stories about what your siblings have done. This can happen at work, too. You might say to yourself, why did we ever agree to sign on for this project? Wasn't anyone thinking? You might belong to a political group, in which at times you say, how did we elect him or her? How did we vote for that? Sometimes we belong to groups that make decisions that we think are dumb, and this can be really, really trying. We've got a couple options, it seems to me. I don't know how you relate to this, but it seems to me that there are at least five things you can do if you belong to a group 
that makes a decision that you don't like, one of the things that you can do is you can battle. You can go to war with the people that made the decision that you don't like. You can armor up, get out your sword, get out your shield, and you can fight. Some people might choose to just pack up their bags and leave, to march off into the sunset and go find another group. That can be a good decision, depending on the group that you're a part of. Some people just give in and say it's not worth the fight. Wave the white flag and capitulate. Give in to the dumb decision. Embrace the dumb decision. Other people might think, I'll just wait it out. This is a dumb decision, but it might get better. I'll just wait. Some people might decide that in the midst of what they think is a, a dumb decision, it's an opportunity for them to grow, to become different, broader people, more expanded, to see things differently, to continue to develop. These are some options that you can pursue if you're part of a group that makes a dumb decision. The Apostle Paul, the circuit-riding preacher, was part of a group of people and many of them were making what he thought to be was a dumb decision. And so this morning what I want to do is invite you to take out a Bible and open it up to the book of Acts. If you've got a smartphone with you, you can open that up and just Google Acts. We'll start in the tale of Acts chapter 14. And we're going to talk about a significant event in the life of the early church in which people saw things from a really different perspective. And so they got together to try to figure out what to do when they were making difficult decisions that not everyone agreed with. I want to give just a little bit of the background before we launch into it. We'll be starting in Acts chapter 14 in the tail end. But I wanted to give just a little bit of a background to kind of set the context. Of course, the whole book of Acts is telling the story of how a group of people are sharing the message of Jesus. This Jewish carpenter had come and lived a perfect life and was born on earth as the Son of God, he took all of humanity's failures and sins on himself, and then he died under the weight of that on the cross. But three days later, he came out of the tomb and rose again, and he ascended to God's right hand. And from God's right hand, he issues the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him, filling them with the fruit of the Spirit and empowering them to live transformed lives that honor him and build his kingdom on earth. And so they took this message and began to share it with others. One of those was a man by the name of Saul, who was a devout Jew who believed that Jesus and his followers were imposters and were going down the wrong track. They'd made a dumb decision. But when he encountered the living Jesus, he was transformed. And he committed the rest of his life to whether or not on horseback, traveling around, and telling people the message of the Jesus that had transformed him. He realized quickly that this message was a message for not just people from one background, but for everyone, and so he shared the message around the world, and he shared the message with people who were not from a Jewish background, people that were unfamiliar with the Jewish story, that were unfamiliar with Jewish culture and the Jewish way of life and Jewish religious concerns. These were pagan, heathen converts. They were renowned for their promiscuity. They were renowned for their carnality, for their barbarity. And so he came to them and he told them, there was a Jewish man that died on your behalf and you can experience a transformed life by believing in him. You can have hope and peace with God as a result. So people embraced this Jesus. But there were also people from a really different background that were Jews like Paul and they saw in Jesus the fulfillment of their Jewish story, the scriptures that here as a community we've been reading through. And they came to recognize that Jesus was the one in whom the whole story came together and made sense. He was the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. And though they had faith in Jesus as their Savior, they continued to see the Jewish law as meaningful. And for many of them, they said that the Jewish law is required, that it needs to be kept. So while they confessed faith in Jesus, they would continue to worship at the Jewish temple. They would continue to keep the Jewish feasts. And in fact, many of them were emphatic that those crazy, barbarous pagans also needed to keep the Jewish law in order to be part of God's family. 
And so this story is the backdrop that we find ourselves in in Acts chapter 15. And there's an experience here in which believers from all over the world gather together in order to see if they can discern how God is leading. And what I want to do now is start in Acts chapter 15. We'll put it up on the screen, but if you've got your Bible, we'll be referencing some things here in Acts also. But we'll jump right into the story. Let's pray together just once briefly. Lord, we need your Spirit to speak to us and to uplift Jesus before us. Open our hearts to do that in his name. Amen. We're in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be what? Saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great what? Joy to all the brethren. And so there's this group of people that come up and they say, hey, unless you're circumcised and keep the law of Moses... You might believe in Jesus, but you can't be saved without that. So Paul and Barnabas and others are traveling now to Jerusalem in order to have a discussion with the apostles about this, to pray about it, to reason together and settle the matter. And on the way, they're describing how when they preach the gospel to these pagan, barbarous people, they've seen the Holy Spirit poured out in their lives in the same way as happens with the Jewish converts. God's Spirit is is moving in a powerful way, and and people now in huge numbers are coming to faith in Christ. And when believers hear this, there's, there's this great joy. The Scripture goes on and says, though, that when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them. And to command them to keep the law of Moses. So now there's this big group and people are having a huge argument over what's the correct way for this to go. There's all these pagan, barbarous people. Who can be saved? Do people have to become Jews in order to become followers of Jesus? Or can they go straight to Jesus without becoming Jewish first? And this argument breaks out and it's easy for us in hindsight to look back and say, man, those Pharisees were a bunch of lunkheads. How many of you can just relate to that? What are they thinking? That's a dumb idea. I just want to remind you that the vast majority of us in this room are probably from the line of those heathen, pagan barbarians. So of course we think the Pharisees had a bad idea because we're not descended from them, most of us. Some of us certainly are. Now, I just want to try to enter into the time period a little bit and to make a case on behalf of the Pharisees just so we can kind of enter into what's going on in their thought process. I know this sounds a little sketchy, but I want to try. There are reasons why the Pharisees would come to think the way they did, and there are reasons why their opinion would have prominence. Those of us that read the story of Jesus in the Gospels, uh, you know, if you've ever picked it up, you'll quickly get the sense that Jesus was opposed to the, what the Pharisees were teaching and what they thought about God. But have you ever noticed verses like this? Jesus is speaking to his disciples and the multitudes, and he says to them, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Have you ever read that? Jesus says, hey, the scribes and the Pharisees are in the seat of, of who? Moses. So what they tell you to do, do it. He goes on to say, of course, don't do what they do, because they say one thing and do another. Now, is this an endorsement of the Pharisees? It is isn't. it isn't, isn't it? There's an element, hey, don't imitate them. It's not a safe example to follow. But what they're teaching, there's some some element to it that you should pay attention to. 
So it's easy to see why the Pharisees, even in the religious community of people that were followers of Jesus, when they said, hey, this is the way to go, a lot of people listened to them and it carried weight. And uh, just as an experiment, do you think it would be easier to give a Bible study just using the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, in favor of circumcision or opposed to circumcision? If you had to pick a team in a debate and the winner of the debate won a bunch of money, and it was just limited to the Hebrew Scriptures, which side of that debate would be easier to find a bunch of verses to support? No circumcision or yay circumcision? Yay circumcision. Uh, We could put up a bunch of these passages, uh, but here, just for instance, Moses speaking, when a stranger dwells with you, speaking to the, the community of faith in Israel, When a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. So there's all these passages in the Hebrew Scriptures in which you find instances that if a foreigner wants to join the community of faith, That person ought to be circumcised, and then he's part of the family, and there's no longer a distinction between him and the Israelites. So you can understand why the Pharisees, who are used to reading the law of Moses regularly, and they're very strict about it, you can understand a little bit where they're coming from when they say, hey, all these guys are are just living wild and crazy and different lifestyles, and in order to be part of God's family, they need to become Jewish. Now, the scripture says that the apostles and elders gathered together. I'm not sure if we have sound on this one. Let's see if we got it. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up. Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So you've got this great moment in which you've got one group of people within the community of faith that are saying, in order to be part of God's family, you have to undergo a surgical procedure. And the other part are saying, no, 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 that's absolutely not true. And at the time, it seemed like the thing would split the church in half. It's at this moment that Peter stands up and he shares his testimony of how he was compelled by the Spirit of God to go share the gospel with a man by the name of Cornelius. And when he shared the gospel with them, they believed and were baptized and they received the Holy Spirit in the same way that all the Jewish believers in Jesus had. When people heard that, they were then willing to listen to Paul, the circuit-riding preacher, 
and his traveling companion Barnabas as they shared their stories, how they had shared the message of Jesus with others and encountered the same thing, that people received the Holy Spirit when they believed in Jesus, even though they were uncircumcised. And so finally, James hears this, and he stands up, and he says this remarkable thing. He says, why are we putting a yoke on the necks of those who are coming to faith, which we ourselves haven't even been able to carry? He's saying, we're part of this story. We were raised in this thing, but we haven't even been able to do this. So why would we put this yoke on? On them. He goes on and he says, Therefore, verse 19, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. Can you say amen to that? James looks at this thing after Peter and Paul and Barnabas shared their experience and they say, It's obvious that God has already decided the matter. The question is whether or not we'll listen to his spirit. And so let's stop bothering people who are coming to faith in Jesus. This is a remarkable moment. This is sort of the center point of the book of Acts because it's paving the way for the worldwide expansion of the message of Jesus. Paul has aspirations to share this good news all over the world. But before they can do that, they've got to settle the matter that people don't have to be circumcised to be saved. Now, one of the things that makes this so remarkable is that Paul was a Pharisee. In fact, in Philippians, you can look at this later, he describes his bona fides as a Pharisee. He describes that he was circumcised on the eighth day. Paul was raised in the schools of the Jews. His lifestyle, catch this, his lifestyle was Jewish. So if you're Paul and you're looking at a bunch of Pharisees who all worship the same way that you've grown up worshiping, who eat the same way that you've eaten, that worship God in the same way that you grew up worshiping God, and then you're looking at a bunch of partying heathen pagans, who does Paul have more in common with in terms of his lifestyle? The Jews. It's easier for him. It's probably more comfortable for him, this lifestyle over here. But Paul, because he recognizes that the message of Jesus is so powerful and so compelling that it's for the entire world, he's willing to lay aside the the culture and the context that he was reared in and not make that binding on people who weren't reared and raised in that context. And he says, okay, let's boil this thing down. What's the main issue that's at stake? And Paul says, time and time and time again is, the main issue at stake is whether or not you believe Jesus is the Son of God. He said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. And Paul's thinking, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, and you you repent and give your life to Him, He will fill you with His Holy Spirit, and He will transform your life, moving you in the direction of the character of God as expressed in the commandments. This is consistently how Paul describes what will happen for people to confess faith in Jesus. And so he says, along with James and others, No reason to put unnecessary obstacles in their way. For a Jewish or a pagan barbarian, it was already difficult enough to embrace a crucified criminal as your Savior. Paul would say, the cross is already a stumbling block. Let's not make it even more difficult for people. Let's make it easy for people who are coming to faith. It's easy for us, 2,000 years removed from this, to really kind of lose sight of what a, what a great choice this was. And I just thought, man, how could you could describe this? Um, Jackson, can I borrow you for a second? I've noticed that you really want to be follow Jesus. And I just thought, as a sign that you want to follow Jesus, you should join the rest of us and have your front teeth knocked out. <laughs> How's that sound to you? No, no. <laughs> Jaden, why don't you help, man? Why don't you, you too. Come on. Both of you guys. Now, you guys can pick. I brought a hammer and I brought pliers. You want the hammer? 
All right, which one do you want? You want the pliers. Perfect. We got them both. Uh, Mel, you want to help with this? Perfect. Right? <laughs> you guys are really good sports. Really good sports. Thank you. Circumcision in a day and age where there's no anesthetic. Right? You think, what are you doing with a hammer and pliers? Well, what do you think they did? You think it was like uh, you're put to sleep and then you wake up and you're in a pain-free environment? You're going to say to a bunch of barbarian, licentious people, okay, hey, if you believe in Jesus, awesome. Uh, we just need you to come with us into the back room. <laughs> Why? What's going to happen? You hear shrieks. Ah! Agony. Torture. Right? This is the thing that the Jewish converts are going to force on everyone and a bunch of people who have already gone through that practice as children are the ones who stand up with eyes opened by the Holy Spirit to say, not necessary. Not going to happen. Don't put a yoke, a weight, a burden, an impediment before them that we ourselves couldn't even carry. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. That's what they decide. And the church moves forward. Now, this is really fascinating because after the council concludes, Paul goes and shares the message with the pagans, with the barbarians, with the Gentiles, and many of the Jewish believers continue to practice their Jewish faith as believers in the Messiah. So even though they believe Jesus is the fulfillment of their story, they're going to continue to go to the temple. They're going to continue to uh, observe the Mosaic law and ritual and practices. They're going to continue to observe the Jewish festivals and feasts. And curiously, even the Apostle Paul is going to continue to do those things. We find him worshiping at the temple later in the books of Acts, uh, making offerings there. And so the Jews that believe in Jesus don't have to throw away all their Jewishness. They just have to recognize that people that aren't Jews don't have to embrace it all. And so Paul is really, really adamant about this. This is fascinating what happens. In the years following the Jerusalem Council, this continues to be a big issue. And Paul is going to continually argue against people that insist on circumcision to follow Jesus. For instance, in Galatians, he writes that when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Right, so Peter's one of the ones that shares the testimony. Uncircumcised people receive the Spirit. But there are times where Peter, when he sees people that, that agree with the circumcision party, he says, well, uh, I can't eat with you guys right now. He separates himself from them as though they're second-class believers. It says the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with Peter so that even Paul's traveling companion Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. This is a huge issue. Uh, many of the leaders in the early movement are making this dumb decision, and so Paul would say things like this. He gets so frustrated. He says in, in Galatians, I wish those who unsettle you, who insist on circumcision, would actually emasculate themselves. Right? He's so angry. He said, if you want to cut something off, then, then just keep cutting, as far as I'm concerned. He goes on and he says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, many of the people in Galatia were beginning to embrace this teaching that they needed to be circumcised. And he says, mark my words. If you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. He says, if you go down that road, then you're essentially saying that the way that you are right with God, the way that you come into relationship with God is on the basis of what you do, not on the basis of what Jesus has already done. And if you think that the way to be right with God is by what you do, then Christ is not able to help you. He continues, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. You've had the practice done. You haven't had the practice done. It doesn't matter. What matters is faith that works through love. 
He'll say this consistently, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but what matters is a new creation. He writes to the Corinthians, was anyone called while he was circumcised? Then let him not become uncircumcised. Some Jewish people actually went through a practice to try to undo the evidence of circumcision in order to be accepted by society. So Paul says, don't, don't do that. But then he says, was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Because circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. And so Paul says, hey, you want to be circumcised? You want to be uncircumcised? Doesn't matter a bit. What matters is faith that works by love. What matters is a new creation. What matters is keeping the commandments of God. These are the three things that Paul says are what matter instead of circumcision. In Paul's mind, these things go together. Because if you believe in Jesus, the risen Messiah, he sends his spirit who pours out his fruits into your life that are in harmony with the direction of God's character as revealed in the commandments. Right? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These things are the fulfillment of the law. Against such there is no law, Paul would tell us. Now, in Paul's mind, is circumcision a big deal? What do you think? How many say, yeah, big deal? How many of you say, no, not a big deal? How many of you are kind of caught in the middle and think, well, it doesn't matter, but it's a big deal? right? It is and it isn't, obviously. Paul is really, 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 really adamantly opposed to anyone that says, in order to be saved, you got to be circumcised. He'll fight against that. He'll say, if you go down that road, if you're circumcised, then Christ is of no value to you. So the believers leave the Jerusalem council in which they make it clear, you don't have to be circumcised in order to be part of God's family. And the most curious thing happens. Acts chapter 16. Check this out. Acts chapter 16. I'm in verse 1. You've got to see this with your own eyes. Acts 16 verse 1. Paul has argued and argued and argued that circumcision doesn't matter, that it's not necessary to be circumcised. Acts 16 verse 1. Then Paul came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted to have him go with him. And he took him and did what? Circumcised him. What? (laughs) What gives? He's argued over and over, written letters. You idiots, why are you doing this? Read Galatians, that's basically it. What's wrong with you? Who has bewitched you? Oh, Timothy, you want to come with me? Oh, great. Uh, Okay, just one thing we need to take care of real quick. And uh, we can be here for a while after. It's okay. We'll take some downtime before we depart on our journey. And he goes and circumcises him in, in, in just less than 15 verses after the Jerusalem council says, no circumcision necessary. So what gives? What in the world? Is Paul a hypocrite? This is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Why did Paul argue so heatedly against circumcision? Why was it? Because it was ceremonial. But he didn't argue against every ceremonial aspect. In fact, he practiced many of them. Yeah, because it was the means of salvation in their minds. It's this idea of this is what you do in order to be saved. And so when people had the mindset that we need to be circumcised in order to be saved, Paul will fight against that like mad. Because he sees that's a threat to the gospel. But why did Paul circumcise Timothy? Because he doesn't want to be a stumbling block to people who think circumcision still has value. And this is the brilliance of Paul. See, Paul's MO is, 
that he will concede to people's convictions and preferences when no principle is at stake. But when there's a, a, a dispute, when there's an argument, he will give priority to those who are coming to the faith. Let me see if we can flesh this out a little bit. There may be people in here who only like hymn music. Paul would walk in and say, you like hymns? Let's do hymns. No problem. But if someone is coming to faith and walks in and says, I can't stand hymns, where's Paul going? Let's use music that's not a stumbling block for those who are coming to faith. Some of you can't stand hymns. You only want praise music. Paul would say, no problem if you like praise music. But if there's someone who's coming to faith that can't stand praise music, let's sing some hymns together. See, Paul's MO is, if you think it's, it's something you need to do in order to be saved, we'll fight against that. But if it's a preference, if it's a conviction, I'm fine. I can get along with that. Unless it gets in the way. Unless it puts a stumbling block before people who are coming to faith. I wonder if there are some other areas that this might connect with our lives. Do you want to be a vegan? Do you want to be a vegetarian? Hey, more power to you. But if that becomes necessary for people who are coming to faith, you've crossed the line, right? Like, if that's something you want to do in order to honor God with a healthy lifestyle, awesome. If you require that of other people in order for them to be accepted by God, you've crossed the line. We've got to give preference to those who are coming to faith when there's no principle at stake. We can go down the list. (laughs) This can be really fun for some of you or really unpleasant for some of you, (laughs) depending on where you find yourself. There are people in this room that would have a conviction that we should have Christmas trees. There are people that would have a conviction in this room that we should not have Christmas trees. Paul would say to us, I don't care one way or the other, but we give preference to those who are coming to faith. Right? Women's ordination, you give preference to those who are coming to faith. What's the nature of Christ? Give preference to those who are coming to faith. You can believe whatever you want to believe, but don't make that a mandatory requirement in order for people to be accepted by God. Democrat, Republican, I can't believe any Christian would vote for. Don't draw a line in the sand that God has not drawn in the sand. Right? Give preference to those who are coming to the faith. Membership in the NRA, I can't believe anyone would. Uh, That's not the issue. The issue is, do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, seated at his right hand, dispensing his Holy Spirit to transform our world? The issue is not NRA membership, right? This is going to be uncomfortable. That's okay. We live in it, some of you are going to laugh at this, but we live in an area where people believe in Bigfoot, man. (laughs) For someone to be part of God's family, do they have to give up or enter into your beliefs concerning Bigfoot? You can believe whatever you want, but don't make it the issue, right? The reason why I'm pretty passionate about this is because I've made things issues that weren't issues, and I've said a lot of stupid things to a lot of people. I've heard a lot of people, and I've said a lot of things I wish I could take back. And so when I read this story, I resonate with it because I say, I've done that. I've been a Pharisee. I've done that. And so this is me just going through a list of things like how to keep the Sabbath. We've got people in this area that think one thing about vaccines and people that think other things about vaccines. we got people that think something about homeschool and public school and private school and whether or not you should watch the NFL. There's lots of issues. You can just put them down however you want. And Paul would say to us, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but don't make that an issue for people that are coming to faith. Let's get out of their way. Let's uplift Jesus and let them embrace the Savior who can give them life and the Savior who gives us life. I thought it would be good for us to just give three practical examples of this in case someone in here, you, maybe you're thinking, man, you're, you're, you know, you're going up the, you're barking up the wrong tree. 
with what you're saying. I just want to give three simple examples of this principle at work in people's lives. Peter uh, told people that Jesus would, in fact, pay the temple tax because that's what good Jewish people did. So Peter went and talked to Jesus, and Jesus said to Peter, in essence, I'm the son of God. The son doesn't have to pay the tax at the temple. So you just told them that I was going to do something that I don't have to do. But then he says this curious thing, nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take the fish that comes up first, and when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. All this is not in Jesus' mind necessary, but he does it because he doesn't want to offend. This is an example from the history of the Adventist movement. One of the founders of the Adventist movement, Ellen White, uh, people often use her writings as a way to sort of manipulate others. And so I try not to, to cite her too much, but I like to cite examples of her which kind of counteract that tendency. Because I think it helps bring a little bit of balance to how we relate to those. And this is one such instance. She's talking to people that are trying to help those that are coming to faith. She says, there are many who try to correct the life of others by, what, by attacking what they consider are wrong habits. They go to those whom they think are an error and point out their defects. They say, you don't dress as you should. They try to pick off the ornaments. <laughs> don't you love that, that language? It's like, like fruit. It's so nice to have you here, sister, but let me just pick that and pick that and pick. Okay, there you go. I just pruned you up nicely. Now you look like what a good follower of Jesus should. Right? That's the, the idea she's saying. But she says they, they pick off the ornaments or whatever they, they think is offensive, but they don't seek to fasten the mind to the truth. Those who seek to correct others should present the attractions of Jesus. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Paul. Lift up Jesus. They should talk of his love and compassion, present his example and sacrifice, reveal his spirit, and they need not touch the subject of dress at all. There is no need to make the dress question the main point of your religion. We could insert a bunch of things in there. There's no need to make cheese the main point of your religion, right? There's no need to make these things the main point of your religion. The main point of your religion is a person. He's Jesus. There is something richer to speak of. Talk of Christ. And when the heart is converted, everything that is out of harmony with the word of God will drop off. It is only labor in vain to pick leaves off a living tree. They'll just reappear. The axe must be laid at the root of the tree and then the leaves will fall off, never to return. What's she saying? She's saying people are not converted by you convicting them over lifestyle issues. People are converted because of the grace and majesty of Jesus. And when they're converted, they'll follow his spirit, and you don't have to be the Holy Spirit for them. Anyone recognize this guy? Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, you pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. This is the voice of prophecy, a voice crying in the wilderness of these modern days. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Coming again, coming. Is coming again. From our Voice of Prophecy studios in Los Angeles, California, we welcome you to this half hour of inspiration and music with the King's Heralds, Del Delker, Brad Braley, and our speaker, H.M.S. Richards, a Seventh day Adventist minister. Beautiful. H.M.S. Richards, senior, one of my heroes in the faith, known in, in circles as the Prince of Preachers, always uplifting Jesus Christ. 
He was uh, almost blind because of an accident, but he was a prolific reader, and, and he was so familiar with Scripture that people said if the Bible was wiped off the face of the earth, he could reproduce all of the New Testament from memory. And if you gave him a verse in the Old Testament, he could tell you the verse before and after. There are accounts of, of people watching him preach in which he's reading from the Bible with it upside down <laughs> because he couldn't read. You know, his, his vision was very bad, and he would just be quoting passages and turning to places, <laughs> but quoting from memory. He had this passion to share Christ with people, and so he thought the way to expand the ministry that God is opening before us is to get on this newfangled thing, the radio. Let's have a radio program in which we tell people about the love of Christ. When many of the brethren heard about HMS Richards wanting to use this demonic medium of the radio, they were incensed. They couldn't believe that someone of principle and integrity would stoop to use such a corrupt device of the devil. If they didn't want to listen to the radio, that's fine. But when it comes to those who are coming to faith, we give them preference. And so he endured the attacks of his brothers in the faith so that he could share the good news with people who hadn't had the opportunity to know Jesus. I have here this beautiful Bible that millions of these have probably been distributed to people. And in the back, you'll find a section with HMS Richards Study Helps. He contracted to have these Bibles with special Bible studies to help people understand Christ and, and Scriptures. He contracted to have these printed, and when he did, he was severely criticized by his brothers in the faith who said, how do you have the audacity to put something that you wrote in the Bible with the rest of Holy Scripture? Do you know what he did? He didn't demonize those men, but he moved forward with his mission to reach people for Jesus. And today, hundreds of thousands of people have been blessed by his ministry that have never met the man in person. H.M.S. Richards said this beautiful thing, and I want to kind of wrap things up here. He said, you'll never do any great work without having to fight against the arguments of what kind of men? Good men. See, HMS Richards would say, hey, you can be violently, you can be radically opposed to what we're trying to do, but if it's for the sake of those who are coming to faith, we're going to go ahead and do it, but we're not going to demonize you for it. We're going to move forward and trust God because this thing is a message for the world. Why do we do this? Because this is what Jesus did for us, man. Everything we experience about the person of Jesus is the result of him painfully enduring sacrifice to give preference to you and me. It was a lot easier to be in the glories of heaven adored by millions of worshiping angels than it was to be in the midst of a crowd of people trying to stone you for your efforts to save them. But Jesus always gave preference to people who were lost so they could come to faith, enduring great personal sacrifice for himself and, and not only for himself, for the whole heavenly community. The angels of God who have never sinned are ministers on our behalf serving us so that we can have a walk with Jesus that they will never know by their own experience. The whole of heaven is wrapped up and giving preference to those who are far from God, giving them an opportunity to know the love and the compassion of Jesus. HMS uh, Richard says, if you're going to do any great work for God, you'll have to fight against the arguments of good men. N.T. Wright wraps up confusingly and beautifully. As followers of Jesus, we need to know the difference between the differences that make a difference and the differences that don't make a difference. The difference that makes a difference is the Son of God. I want to encourage you in your interactions with others to continue to uplift Jesus and make it easy for those who are coming to faith. 
to not set obstacles in their way as a church community to, to think and to vision. How can we make it easier and remove more obstacles so more people can come to experience the goodness and faithfulness of God? I want to invite you to stand with me as we sing a closing hymn together. Reflecting on the goodness of God, great is thy faithfulness. trespasses and sins for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God amen